So here's a few comments on William Blake's illustrations of the book of Job, one of his last works. Many commentators regard it as his greatest complete work, made in 1825, just a couple of years before he died. I'm drawing a lot on Kathleen Raine's analysis, and particularly because this book of Job is so important in modern understandings of Christianity. Jung famously writes his book, Answer to Job, that some regard as Jung's greatest work, in which Jung argues that the suffering of humanity by the divine creator, witnessed by the divine creator, could only be responded to by the divine itself becoming human and suffering as well. This in turn picks up on Jakob Burma's interpretation at the birth of the modern period in which the relationship between humanity and divine is often said to be one of necessary separation in order that in humanity the divine could come to know itself. And this in turn echoes a profound strand in Western Christianity which sees even an infinite gulf between the creator and the creation as if that can't be bridged except by an exceptional moment in the divine story which is interpreted as the birth of the Christ uniting what formerly had been so profoundly separated. And I think that Blake's reading through his illustrations of the book of Job is a counter to all that. If you look at the opening title page, for example, notice that the seven angels there, the seven angels often refer to the Elohim, the plural word for God in the Hebrew Bible. Blake interprets that seven in various ways, often a sevenfold unfolding of creation. And what's so striking about these seven angels is that they're all looking so that we can see their faces around the world, the cosmos, as it can be seen, except for the one who is looking into the page, as if drawing us into what's to be unfolded. And Kathleen Rain suggests that William Blake saw the book of Job as illustrating the completion of creation, that the creation wouldn't be perfected until humanity knew of itself to contain the innate divine, the human form divine, as William Blake puts it. And so realise that creation isn't a separation from the divine, but is a manifestation of the divine. That in knowing ourselves properly, we know ourselves to be incarnations. And that completing the creation is the awakening of humanity. For Blake, it's not sin that's the problem, this gulf that supposedly separates, but sleep that forgets the true nature of ourselves. And he reads the book of Job as the struggle to awaken, the struggle to realise the truth of the human form divine. The predicament that Blake sees Western Christianity has fallen into is portrayed in the first plate, thus did Job continually. And it shows Job and his family seemingly in harmony, certainly with themselves. It appears at first glance to be a happy scene, 
Job and his wife with their books by which they live their life open in front of them. Job has plenty. You can see the tents that hold all his goods alongside his many, many sheep that fill up the space behind the tree. But there's an indication here that things are not all that they seem to be. The sheep are asleep with a sheepdog even resting its muzzle on a sheep. And whilst the Gothic building behind them seems to reflect the rising sun, it's almost as if Job and his family hardly know that it's there. It's fallen towards the horizons of their awareness. And Kathleen Rain particularly remarks that it's these musical instruments hanging unnoticed on the tree that is so significant as well. Because in Blake's mythology, poetry, painting and music were the things that weren't swept away at the flood and so can be sources of divine inspiration if we know how to engage with these arts, which Job and his family appear to have forgotten in favour of a moral understanding of the law based on righteousness. And, of course, righteousness readily tips into self-righteousness, which is going to become so important later in Blake's interpretation of the book of Job. And Blake puts this across very forcibly. Our Father, which in heaven hallowed be thy name, is written across the top of the plate. A seemingly good prayer to utter, maybe the central prayer of the Christian cult. And yet Blake would have known that it was often written alongside the Ten Commandments in the churches of Georgian England, and so becomes an empty recitation by which is meant that in the reciting of it itself is felt to be the completion of the Christian path, which of course leaves the individual unchanged, untransformed. It's the kind of church going that sees everything as a duty, that sees the goal of the Christian life to live morally, to live an upright life, to live a righteous life. And Blake makes this quite clear in the little plate the little altar at the bottom of the plate there where he writes the letter killeth the spirit giveth life it is spiritually discerned lines from the apostle saint paul written there on an altar as if again the ritual performance of modern western christianity is all that's required but of course that's the letter that killeth and leads those who believe Christianity to be that way, to fall asleep and not know that it's the spirit that giveth life and spiritually the truth of the one religion, Blake puts it, which is told in one way in the Christian telling. That's how it is known. So Blake interprets the book of Job as how Job awakens from the wastes of the moral law, feeling that his righteousness is what counts, following the dead cult of religiosity, rather than realising that authority doesn't lie in an institutional church with its hierarchies, but instead lies in the inner hierarchy that is the divine light innate in all human beings, which if we can be in the service of flames and ignites and inspires us with the poetic and prophetic voice that Blake saw was so needed in the modern period. And that story starts to move in the second plate, which shows the angel of the divine presence, the God figure sitting at the top in a great halo sun of light. Then in the next tier down shows Satan, 
before God. Interestingly, the most dynamic figure in the image at this stage, Satan, in a shorthand you could say, stands for the personification of selfhood, as Blake put it, that sense that the ego is the most important focus for life without realising that that actually cuts us off from the source of life. And meanwhile, in the bottom part of the image, Job and his family again, they're not in quite such a formal pose, but nonetheless, they're relatively unaware of what's unfolding above them, what's unfolding within them, and so are continuing to follow the letter of the law, follow what they believe their religiosity requires. But you might see that Job is looking a bit anxious now. The angels seem to be trying to tell him something. And he points with his finger at what he thinks he knows, but is beginning to sense in that worried look, perhaps not is all as he thought it is. And his wife looks on too, as if querying and questioning. You can look at the surrounding of the image as well and see peacocks and parrots. Peacocks, very beautiful, but proud birds. Parrots who just repeat without understanding. And Blake calls this image, when the Almighty was yet with me, when my children were about me, as if Job doesn't quite know what it is for the Almighty to yet be with him. And he's about to discover what's written at the top of the image there. We shall awake up in thy likeness. Whenever Blake portrays something portentous or whenever, even in the darkest moments that Job's about to discover, there's always hope. And Blake signals in the second plate what it's going to mean for Job, for humanity, for us to wake up and know of the divine likeness within us. It's also signalled because throughout the plates, the God figure is the same as the figure of Job. They are shown as a likeness. But Job doesn't know that yet. And so in plate three, B Blake shows what happens when the selfhood is unleashed, when its implicit assumption that it understands that it's right, that it's separate from God, which is often forgotten and just instead experienced as being a totality unto itself, when that's unleashed. And Blake now shows Satan coming down and causing havoc amongst Job's family, amongst, you might say, Job's world, his inner life. Remember, Blake always realised that the material world is but an abstraction of mental reality and that the imagination is prior to what the imagination perceives. And so when the imagination misunderstands, it causes havoc in the world. And you can see Satan here portrayed similarly to Blake's image of the spectre, a character that features in his great poem, Jerusalem, the emanation of the giant Albion. The spectre is that part of ourselves that tells us we can work it out, we can solve all problems, we can individuate. Deliberately there to use the Jungian expression because whilst Jung changes his mind on this, Jungianism often now takes individuation to be the goal, as if an isolated island self can somehow gather the various parts of itself together, integrate its shadow and so become whole. But this is to misunderstand Blake and the perennial philosophy who realise that the goal for the self is not to self-individuate, but is to 
realise that it's but a reflection of the divine self. It's to open onto the universal reality and be in the service of that rather than to try to gather itself together and make something of itself which of course is a kind of functional atheism as if we aren't manifestations of the divine but are created at an infinite distance from the divine with the divine in deism in natural religion in atheism most explicitly being forgotten and it is a terrible havoc that unleashes and the darkness of the book of Job the fire of God is fallen from heaven characterizes the first of the terrible plates that Blake uses to unpack the modern predicament it comes in waves as plate four shows Job and his wife sitting on their stony thrones as if in front of a stony, as Blake would put it, druid temple. Blake understood stone circles and associated them with druidism, a religiosity that's based on sacrifice maybe the literal sacrifice of others, but for Blake even more tellingly, the spiritual sacrifice that would sacrifice the human form divine within us in the mistaken belief that that's what's required to reach God because the self isn't understood as a manifestation of the divine, but is understood as fallen, separate, in need of an external redemption. And so Job and his wife seem to be sitting before that temple and therefore are confused and start to slip into despair when first the messenger comes saying that your sons are being destroyed and then you can see a second messenger coming and saying that the fire of God is fallen, the flocks as well are being consumed. The Gothic cathedral there in the background is no longer radiating, it's falling from their awareness, even as the dark clouds start to gather as well. Nowadays, with the Christian church in decline in the West, that has these powerful modern assumptions, as if growth, as if morality, as if the correct rights, the correct ethics, is what makes for Christianity. You can't help but see that church in the image of Job and his wife sat before their temple, bemused that bad news is arriving, that their world is falling apart. And that sense is then deepened in plate five, where back in the heavens, Satan asks not just to afflict the external world in which Job thinks he should be living happily, but the inner world of Job as well, to bring down the poison of selfhood into his very body. And again, it's so interesting how Blake portrays this. Um, Job is shown at the bottom about to receive the curses of Satan, selfhood, but is performing his rigid duty still. He's giving alms to the poor. And there's something that's good about this. The angel stood to their side there, looks pious, but you'll see in the background the stone trilothon. This is the dead religion that doesn't understand the nature of connection with the divine that thinks it's through some kind of moral act, some kind of self-sacrificial giving away that connection with the divine is formed. And also in this plate, you notice something else that the divine figure in the high heavens is looking less confident himself. He's not sitting so squarely on the throne. He's 
beginning to slip from it. And again, the image in the divine face is the same as the image in Jake in Job's face. Not so sure, confused, worried, anxious. And I think this is significant because if the human form divine is the innate truth of our being, then how we understand God will be deeply connected to how we understand ourselves. And so in this troubled, worrying state, Job is beginning to feel that maybe the God he believed in isn't so powerful. Maybe the divine spirit that he'd taken to be part and parcel of his religiosity isn't so efficacious that God is slipping from the omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent throne that Job had put him on. And you'll notice in the words that Blake has at the top of the plate, Job is pleading his righteousness. Did I not weep for him who was in trouble? Was not my soul afflicted for the poor? He's clinging to his ethical religiosity. It's beginning to slip from him, and yet there's still the word of hope, because Blake also writes, Behold, he is in thy hand, but save his life. The selfhood can ruin a life, but it can't actually take the divine life from us. There isn't an ultimate separation. There's only a falling asleep into selfhood. Blake is affirming. And the full torment of Job's predicament is shown in plate six. Perhaps the fear he had had all along when Satan, the selfhood, gleefully pours down the poisons of affliction, the arrows of disease. Job's wife interestingly here is shown lamenting and weeping for her husband which actually is different from the book of Job in the Bible where Job's wife curses Job and presumes that he must be doing something wrong. Blake holds back from that but still the sun is slipping rapidly now beneath the horizon because the clouds have gathered and Job himself doesn't understand what's going on. He says the law gave and the Lord have taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Clinging to this sense that he can't have made a mistake. It must just be a random, mysterious, if horrible act of God that he must just accept and submit to. His confused religiosity is deepening. And I think Blake perhaps intimates that with what he shows at the bottom of the image. Pictures of rotting nature, a broken creation with the grasshopper, with the broken jug, with the frog buried in the mud. The very form of the world seems to be falling apart for Job because he is falling into the pit, which is the assumption that he's infinitely separate from the divine. And Blake sees reflected again in his three friends who now appear in plate seven. Job is being nursed by his wife, propped up against his temple, interestingly looking up at a stone that looks a bit like the shape of the cross, as if this understanding of Christianity that the cross bridges the gulf between the human and the divine is his last final hope. And it's the false hope he's beginning to realise that his world has been built on, shown I think in the buildings on the hillside behind the
the group that Blake has shown as well, as if that's the Western civilization that Blake was wanting to expose. What shall we receive good at the hands of the Lord, and shall we not also receive evil? His friends say. Again, this is a incomprehensible God who somehow gives good but also gives evil. That's just the nature of what it is to fall into the hands of God. There's an implicit criticism of the Jungian interpretation of the divine here, as if the divine must somehow bring together good and evil, hold good and evil that we would experience at different parts of our life, which Blake, I think, would understand more as the condition of being asleep, the Eurozenic, the Allro awareness that feels darkness is separation from God into an evil domain, rather than realising it's a limited, constrained perception that can awaken once more, perhaps intimated in the blaze of the sunset, the sun's now disappeared, and yet still gives a kind of last gasp of light, as if to try to illuminate the comments of these three friends, but they don't see it. They just see themselves reflected, mirrored in Job's state, and so rent their clothes, cast dust upon their heads, and fall into preoccupation with righteous, self-righteous, this worldy religiosity. In Plate 8, Job himself now laments his state. He holds up his hand, looks to the heavens. Let the day perish when in I was born, he says. He doesn't understand that he, his life is born into the eternity of the divine life and so assumes that his birth is but his material existence, his mortal existence, his finite existence. And of course, he now curses that because the finite, the mortal, the physical, the single vision has seized him and it's terrible. And even his friends recognize it's terrible. His wife there still despairs. She knew that all along. And so they grieve for him seven days and seven nights. Notice the echo there of the seven, seven being the number that will actually complete the awakening, will bring the realisation. But at this moment, they're unaware of that. And so in the darkness, they lament. Lo, let that night be solitary and let no joyful voice come therein. The Eurozenic law-giving deity starts to be exposed in plate nine. It comes in the vision of Eliphaz, one of the friends, who believes that he's seeing a true vision of the divine. He has a dream. He's lying in his bed, looks up and sees this seemingly divine figure, a spirit passed before my face, the hair of my flesh stood up. But it's a false god. It's a Eurozenic divine. Perhaps Blake shows this because the hands can't make their lost in the gown. The upright figure seems stiff, almost like an idol. And Eliphaz's words are written around the top there. Shall mortal man be more just than God? Shall a man be more pure than his maker? This is the accusation that this law-giving Eurozen makes to the mortal finite self and so crushes it, refuses the life from it. And Job, his wife, and the two other friends look up 
partly in wonder at a vision, partly in fear at what's been seen, but I wonder too whether in the face of Job and his wife is the beginning of a questioning. Is this really so? Perhaps echoed in the other part of the quote that Blake writes across the top, Behold he putteth, he, behold, he putteth no trust in his saints, and his angels he chargeth with folly. Can that be right? This is something about the problem of evil, even. Is this arbitrary, incomprehensible embrace of evil, as if that's part of God? Does that really stack up? Job, I think, in Plate 9 is beginning to question that. The combination of accusation from the friends and I think Job's nascent questioning stroke undoing continues in in plate 10. The friends all point their fingers at Job. The just upright man is laughed to scorn. This plate is called and there are birds squawking beneath as if mocking Job as well. There's chains wrapping around this this picture, it's a, a picture of imprisonment. And I think that that is also Blake echoing to Socrates, because in another image he shows Socrates in quite a similar way with the three accusers of Socrates at Socrates' trial pointing at him like this. And maybe this is intimating that Job is in the state that Socrates understood so well, in the effort to know himself, he needed to embrace that if there was one thing he knew for sure, was that he was aware of the limits of his ignorance. That emptying, that admitting that the ego doesn't understand what it thinks it does, is a key part of the awakening. And Job's wife here looks on as if emphasising that she is beginning to stand for the spiritual side of ourselves that can't quite ever finally be suppressed. She's saying, is it really true what the mockers are saying? Is there not something that we might understand here? And Job opens his hands as if to embrace this emptiness. But Blake also doesn't sentimentalise the spiritual path, and in Plate 11 shows the full horror of what not knowing can be like, of having to lose control, empty one's assumptions, let go of the path, the moral certainty, the comfort, of ritual that were presumed to be the way. In this image, with dreams upon my bed, thou scarest me and affrightest me with visions. There's a chaos here, as this figure who in one moment looks a bit like Elohim creating Adam in another one of Blake's famous images, but with the cloven foot there and the great serpent wrapped around the body and this strange face and hair that looks like a sun but actually isn't the divine light. It's purely a monstrous face generated from the twisted, contorted, pent-up energy of the figure self-contained within itself who when you look, you see also is pointing towards the tablets of stone, this dead religiosity, as well as pointing down to the false fire of the demons, the false spirit, the false life of this trapped, confined world, which the image also shows so much. God is not present so far as Job feels it in this state of mind and there's something deeply humane actually about this image as well as terrifying because 
the suffering of the path can feel like darkness without hope. It can feel like all is lost and that the worst fears that one had about the state of finite, mortal, decaying reality cut off from the divine is true. Job feels that in this moment, in a world where humanity feels it must save itself. It can't rely on any inspiration, any prophetic revelation. It must use its own powers manifest in reason, in the sciences devoid of the sense of God. And Blake writes that it's the wicked and the hypocrites that triumph in this world, as so many people fear now. And yet still there's hope, even in this bleak moment, because Blake writes beneath, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand in the latter days upon the earth. And after my skin destroy thou this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, who I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. In the flesh we'll see God, which isn't just, for Blake, a sense that there might be a resurrection. Because prior to that moment at the end of times, is the realisation that in our flesh now we can know and see God. And in fact, what's called the end times, what's called the resurrection, is just the completion of the divine awakening that can be known even in this moment. The end of time comes not at the end of history, as Kathleen Rain once remarked. It comes in the moment of awakening, when the world is known as a manifestation of the eternal when the human is recognized as part of the divine life when individuation isn't understood to be a gathering into the separate self the disparate parts of the personality and experience but is understood as experience and disparate parts of the self being a path into the all and so the self is known to be in the service of the divine. When creation isn't seen as an act that separates what's created from the creator, but is seen as a continual unfolding in time of what's taken place in eternity. And in the next plate, 12, the young figure of Elihu appears. And there's a turn here. Elihu, I am young, and ye are very old, wherefore I was afraid. This new spirit, which is actually a remembrance of things, unclouded by the old assumptions of the deadening religiosity, starts to speak this reference to youth is very significant for Blake. In the preface to his great poem, Milton, he writes, Rouse up, O young men of the new age. Set your foreheads against the ignorant hirelings. For we have hirelings in the camp, the court, and the university, who would, if they could, forever depress mental and prolong corporeal war. Painters, sculptors, architects, he invokes, remembering the arts that weren't swept away by the flood. Believe Christ and his apostles. And so here we have Elihu echoing that call that Blake writes in the preface to Milton. There's a new age coming, Blake inventing that phrase, I think. And those who are young, who not only despair of the times, but because of their youth, seek a new vision and understand that there's something to be recovered that's being lost in the mechanical philosophy of Newton and Locke, that they'll reach out for something else, even as Elihu here points to the skies. As before, Blake 
partly unpacks this for us as we contemplate the plate with what he engraves around the central image. On the one hand, he writes above, for his eyes are upon the ways of man and he observeth all his goings. I think this must be intimating to the trapped, self-righteous, self-obsessed kind of religiosity that Job now clearly is questioning in the image and even his friends have quieted for a while. But in the small print beneath the image is given again what might emerge even from the sleeping body that you can see at the bottom of the plate where Blake writes, look upon the heavens and behold the clouds which are higher than thee, which is what Blake sees in plate 13, the famous moment when, as it's put, God answers Job out of the whirlwind. But what Job starts to see in Blake's understanding is the human form divine reflected in God appearing from the whirlwind. The friends can't look up. They don't understand at all. This revelation is sheer terror to them. But Job and his wife, his wife, I think with a smile now, realising that there's an awakening that's possible, they start to see something different. Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Blake's written above the image, an accusation of those who speak about these things without understanding what they're saying. And you can see a God image surrounded by angels beginning to appear from the clouds as well at the top of the picture there. This is an echo, I think, of what's going to appear in a subsequent plate when the morning stars join together with the angelic hosts singing of divine truth. It's beginning to appear because the whirlwind, whilst in one moment can be terrifying, also, of course, clears the sky of the clouds and can begin, therefore, the process of Job awakening. It's Job's peak experience, if you like, his trip, his disturbing ecstasy that is very hard to make sense of in itself, but jolts old assumptions and so turns around that sense of unknowing from being a distressing kind of emptiness to a moment where something can be precipitated, something can be remembered, and light can flood in, as is shown in the beautiful plate 14, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. We here have Job really clearly beginning to see that he is part and parcel of this divine reality and that if he looks up he can peer through the clouds that have encaverned him. Blake here referencing Plato's myth of the cave and see not only the manifest world with Apollo there dancing on the chariot of the sun and Artemis there with the chariot of the moon, but realise that the so-called material reality is just an abstract, empirical portal sense through which divine reality can be known and that the human form divine shown in the God figure as well as in Job now, bridges those worlds. This is part of the human vocation coming to be seen by Job. This is what humanity is for. Blake felt that we human beings have a positive role in returning the natural world to the divine from whence it came, of which it's a manifestation, and how it will exist in eternity. He was rather against his fellow romantics, Wordsworth, and even Coleridge, latterly, 
who were inclined to take a pantheistic or panentheistic view. He felt that if you treat nature as divine, rather than seeing nature as a theophany, you are with the devil's party, as he puts it. You haven't understood that all is one. You haven't understood the true nature of the spirit of all things and are at risk, if in a different way, of falling back into the kind of religiosity that makes for suffering. Nowadays, I think of this as the further working out of the intimations that are associated with Jacob Burma, just with the qualification that I'm not sure this is what Burma was actually saying, but is the Hegelian understanding, even in some forms of process theology, that nature, the creation, needs to go through its evolution in order to complete the divine. But Blake would say, on the one hand, that is to introduce the risk of the fallen sight, the isolated awareness winning the day, but also isn't a true perception, which is to know of the oneness of all things, so that the angels are also the morning stars, that the sun and the moon are also expressions of the divine, and quintessentially that the human form divine speaks of the innate divinity within us all. That is the true nature of creation which Blake associates with the days of creation from the book of Genesis that he puts around this lovely image. But Job still doesn't fully understand. Blake also writes above, Canst thou bind the sweet influence of Pleiades, or loose the bands of Orion? There's something important to understand about the nature of the human imagination, which Blake unpacks in the next stage of the story, in Plate 15, where God shows Job and those around him the tremendous wonders of the created world, and particularly, behold now, behemoth, which I made with thee. And this is what Job is now promised. Not reconciliation with the divine, but a return to the divine by knowing of the wonders of creation and seeing how in myriad ways the divine presence is known through even seemingly terrible tremendous beasts. Job is to learn how to sing of those wonders, how to express those wonders, the true vocation of the ants and indeed the sciences. Can any understand the spreadings of the clouds, the noise of his tabernacle. Not fully, you might say, but there's an invitation there to understand the tremendous things. And so behold, behemoth, which of course doesn't just mean study as if separate, but feel the life of, participate in and with. And the opening lines from Jerusalem, the emanation of the giant Albion, come to mind here as well because, as Blake puts it there, of the sleep of all Rhone, of the passage through eternal death, and of the awakening to eternal life. This theme calls me in sleep night after night, and every morn awakes me at sunrise. Then I see the Saviour over me, spreading his beams of love, and dictating the words of this mild song. Awake, awake, O sleeper of the land of shadows, wake, expand. I am in you, and you in me mutual in love divine. And when that happens, as in plate 16, Satan, the selfhood, is spontaneously judged, found wanting when set alongside 
what's good, beautiful and true. And this is how Blake interprets the casting down of Satan falling from the heavens. God now is back on the divine throne, alive, beaming with authority and clarity that is being communicated directly into the eyes of Job too here. And Blake explains more of what Job has experienced with this quote from the Bible, again in the small print, God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. This is the nature of the emptying out that what is weakness in one moment is actually an opening to a true strength that what was a self-reflective, self-referencing kind of wisdom, the ratio, as Blake puts it, has been found wanting because it can't see the all. It only understands things through the Eurozenic materialistic vision that amplifies the sense of egoic reality. And that is cast down now, making way for true vision to come in, not the morality of righteousness and self-righteousness that had trapped Job before, even when he thought that his life was blessed. And the heart of that is shown in plate 17, where Job realises that the imagination, the mind, is, as Kathleen Rain puts it, the ground, the cause, and the place of all that we know in the world, because then it radiates with the divine life. I have heard thee with the hearing of the ear, but now my eye seeth thee, Blake writes below the ear, standing for the empirical senses, and the eye here, standing for the eye of the imaginative mind. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. If ye loved me, ye would rejoice, because I shall, said I shall go unto the Father. I and my Father are one. Part of the many references that Blake writes around this image, which even shows God blessing Job and his wife, even one of Job's accusers and friends wants to have a look at what's being revealed here. As if to underline it, Blake writes above, he bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up Job's experience, but adding, we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. When you see the divine, as the divine is, you also see yourself, you know yourself at last, and are aware that your face communicates the divine face, even as Job and God look alike in the engravings, and that the one light of divine being is the light and being that you can know of in yourself, and so not experience life as a threat of darkness, a threat of being undone by Satan or selfhood. And now Job is able to be in the world in a different way, not following moral precepts that he doesn't fully understand as he had done before, but with his own sight illuminated, praying for his friends, finding that his prayers are acceptable to the Lord, not because he's got the right formulas, the right rituals, but because he understands how to hold out his hands. In Blake's imagery, that's always an echo of the cruciform form of Christ, who is the manifestation in the imagination, in the mind of 
the oneness of all things, light and darkness, life and death, human and divine, being part and parcel of the same unfolding. And the great flame on Job's altar now not being a sacrifice as if God requires something to bridge the gulf, but itself being the light, the life, the dance, the energy that is both in heaven and on earth. This great flame bridges these two seeming realms, pierces through the clouds that can appear to separate them. And so Job is seen here as at one with God in prayer and praise. In plate 19, this starts to have an unexpected effect because now the friends bring gifts to Job and his wife. You'll notice that they're now sitting in the foot of a tree, a tree of life, a tree of awakening, a tree of true knowledge and wisdom, and that the old temple has seemingly fallen into a ruin behind them, giving way to new life, symbolised in the rising corn, bearing much fruit. And everyone also gave him a piece of money. That's so interesting because it's, I think, the friends, the neighbours' hearts responding to what they see is now in Job and his wife's heart, which is abundance, is plenteousness, is generosity, free of the fear that things must be held on to, that possessions must be counted. And as Job and his wife's heart speak to the hearts of those around him, they too want to give of their abundance, of their generosity. And so there's a wonderful exchange that is seen in this image of human life that is an echo of the divine reality of outpouring. You remember that early on in the story there'd been the undoing of Job's external world and then the undoing of his internal world. Well, if there's now been a restoration of his external world, a remembrance of its true nature, now there's a remembrance of Job's true inner nature as well, because Blake shows how what Job has that's most intimate to himself, um, his sons and his daughters, are beautiful. They are lovely. He sees all things in the spiritual light that is a light within him as well. And he understands all that he's been through too as bringing this completion shown in the Roundels, the images behind Job here, recounting his suffering that he now knows wasn't a sacrifice to bridge the gulf of sin, but was the struggle to awaken through realising quite how desperately he had fallen asleep. If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there too. God is everywhere, Job now realises because the imagination is the holder, container, manifestation of the one reality. And you'll notice too that musical instruments have appeared again in the bottom of the plate, as if ready for what's going to unfold in the final image. Because Blake now knows how precious are thy thoughts unto me, O God, how great is the sum of them and so can sing of them. His family now are stood. The instruments are taken down from the tree and they're playing them. And the Lord has blessed Job, latterly more than at the beginning, as the Bible puts it. And I think Blake is showing here that that's so because Job knows how to bless the Lord now in a mutual exchange. You'll see that the sunrise is on the other side of the tree from before. And so 
this is the seventh day of creation being completed. It's not a static Sabbath. It's a lively, dynamic realisation of the story of humanity. Great and marvellous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, O King of Saints. There's a remembrance of the mistakes of before in the altar at the bottom, where Job has written, In burnt offerings for sin thou hast no pleasure. Don't slip back into the old ways, Blake is reminding us. And if we stay in the new realisation, which is the eternal truth, if we embrace the arts of the imagination, the painting, the poetry and the music that can keep alive in our minds and lives the nature of all things in their divine truth, then we can live 140 years. We can see the generations before us because they are as many successive expressions of eternal life. Time takes on this kairos quality rather than chronos quality. And as the book of Job puts it, Job died being old and full of days. Well, I think Blake would interpret that as Job having travelled through seeming eternal death and awoken now to eternal life, full because he knows what God says to him. I am in you and you in me, mutual in love divine.